Welcome, I'm Ben. And I'm John. Welcome to the ECG Stampede Conference Edition. This is meant to supplement the curriculum and the ECGs are gonna be a bit more challenging. These were submitted by our residents and faculty and intended to just kind of supplement your ongoing education. Let's keep those skills up. Let's continue to improve and get better. John? Yeah, the way we use these are we incorporate them into a bi-monthly conference didactic sessions where we sit down in small groups with our residents and our med students and really take deep dives into each of these ECGs, really, again, as a refresher and to keep up our ECG skills. Bi-monthly, is that twice a month or every other month? Every other month. <laughs> I've never understood that. Yeah, that's tough. Let's get going. This is case number one. We'll jump right into it. There's a 94-year-old male that presented with shortness of breath. John, what do you think? Admit, 94 years old. <laughs> Standard community line there. Yes, yes. All right, so we'll take a look at this. Uh, my first impression is when I look at the ECG, it's really, really slow. I count out six QRS complexes, so I think the rate's One, about two, three, four, 36. Yeah. Okay. Uh, when I look at the rhythm, I don't see any P waves or any sinus uh, activity. Uh, so I do not believe this is a sinus rhythm. Uh, and if you really march out those QRS complexes from the first beat to the second beat, second beat to the third beat, that looks pretty regular, and then that third to fourth beat interval yeah. looks a little shorter. Right, and then it kind of picks Comes up regular again. Then there's that PVC, which we're just going to ignore for now. Yeah, so, you know, it, it looks slightly irregular, so in the back of my mind, possibly slow AFib, but I think we'll try to come back to that and see what, what comes of that. Uh, in regards to the axis, it looks like there's a left axis deviation. Um, probably secondary to a left anterior fascicular block, given the, the severe left axis deviation. Uh, or, the, or this is just a slow escape rhythm that's more distal, and that happens to be where the escape rhythm picked up. But as we'll see in a, a prior ECG, this patient does have a known anterior fascicular block anyway. So yeah, it could be. Sure, sure. Uh, in regards to intervals, we don't have a PR interval. The QRS complex is maybe a touch wide. Um, if you look at V2, we might be seeing that RSR prime morphology, um, so a possible underlying right bundle branch block, um, even though our T waves don't typically uh, appear upright after those. Mm -hmm. And uh, our QT uh, uh, looks normal. In terms of ischemia, I don't see any significant ST segment abnormalities, but I do see some T wave inversions in the inferior leads. I uh, would really like an old ECG to compare to to see if that's new or not. Great. Okay, so before we dive into the rhythm just a little bit more, you have a patient with a really slow rate here, and you can may even make an argument that that PVC is probably not perfusing. So you wonder if the functional rate is really something like on the order of 30, right? So pretty slow, and he seems like he's symptomatic. We're not giving any information about his hemodynamic status, but what are the initial critical actions here? Yeah, so whenever anyone rolls in with a rate this slow or any critical patient in the ED, I think the old mantra of IV O2 monitor is a safe starting point. Uh, in addition to that, I would really like to get some pacer pads on this patient. Um, and then we'll make some decisions based on that hemodynamic stability, mental status, uh, et cetera, in determining whether or not we're going to turn those on. Cool, and I know our residents are getting really excited because they see this and they're like, transvenous pacer time, baby. Dropping that pacer. Yeah, drop it. Like it's hot? Sure. No. <laughs> Just lukewarm, like it's, maybe it's, normal body temperature. Yeah, like a, like 98 degrees Celsius. <laughs> drop it like it's 98 degrees yeah. Celsius. Jeez. Getting nervous. The surface of the sun. Yes. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the rhythm a little bit. What sort of rhythm do you think is going on here? Sure. So... My, my gut t is telling me that this is most likely slow AFib, uh, given the fact that there is that bit of irregularity there. Mm -hmm. uh, if I knew that she had a history of AFib and had old ECGs that showed AFib, I'd feel probably even a little bit more comfortable making he that He does diagnosis. have a history of AFib. Yeah. So to me, this is slow AFib. Okay. Yeah, good. Uh, this is definitely slow AFib. You'd want to take a really good medication history of this patient, right? Look for things like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, DIG. Yeah, yeah, DIG. Not really used as much anymore, but DIG toxicity and is... And always a, great fodder for boards, though. Yes, on the in-service, on the board exam, slow AFib, think DIG toxicity. I don't really see the Dolly mustache here. No. But 
Slow way fib. Yeah. Not for Didge. Uh, agree. I think it's slow way fib. And I will just make a comment about some of the regularity. This is a little bit more regular than I typically expect a fib. So I do wonder if maybe there's an escape rhythm in there. And in fact, if you took this out even further, you would see that these R to R intervals marched out pretty consistently over time. Ultimately, this is a patient that was eventually diagnosed with complete heart block with atrial fibrillation by an EP study. I don't know exactly how to explain this one beat that comes a little bit prematurely. Maybe there was a superior pacemaker that just kind of took over spuriously for a, a brief fraction of a second and then it kind of picked back up. And then of course you've got that PVC that kind of throws off the regularity as well. But when you do see regular a regular rate and the setting of what appears to be atrial fibrillation, so no P waves, especially if the patient has a known history of atrial fibrillation, you ought to think of complete heart block and atrial fibrillation, which is what we believe this patient had. So, so Ben, one, one last point, and one, or really one more question. Would you consider any other rhythms here, maybe like a junctional rhythm or any electrolyte abnormalities when looking at the CCG? Yeah, definitely. So the rate itself, if you only consider the rate and you were suspecting that this were an escape rhythm, uh, which is a reasonable thing to expect with a rate of 30, then I would say that this is probably a more distal escape rhythm, meaning a ventricular escape rhythm, less likely junctional. Junctional is typically somewhere around 40 to 50, maybe up to 60. Once you get faster than 60, we call that an accelerated junctional rhythm. But I would say this is probably ventricular just based on the rate. And then we see that the QRS is probably wide. It's pretty borderline, right? It's right at about 120, but I would call this wide and that would also support a ventricular escape rhythm. I don't know for sure though, because if we do compare this with a prior ECG like we're about to on the next slide, the, the QRS complex looks very similar. So it's possible that this was a junctional escape rhythm that went through the rest of the conduction system the exact same way as he had been on prior ECGs, most likely a ventricular escape though. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. Just whenever i see slow rhythms without p waves something to keep in mind is hyperkalemia and i think that was a really good explanation of why we think this is less likely uh, coming from the junction and more likely more distal in the conduction system cool and here is that prior ecg this is a, a much faster rate first you can tell that but this is really intended to be a rhythm case so atrial fibrillation uh irregularly irregular you look at the qrs complexes and it kind of has this right bundle branch block morphology the rsr prime is not clearly visualized in v1 but it was on other ecgs and it does have that morphology so uh right bundle branch block there's an extreme left axis deviation, so there's a left anterior fascicular block as well. So this is a bifascicular block with atrial fibrillation. All right, so let's jump into our second case for the conference series. This case comes from a patient who was 63 years old, and she came in complaining of generalized weakness. Ben, what do you see here? By the way, I looked up 98 degrees Celsius, 209 Fahrenheit. So you're almost like able to bake a cake. Yeah. I, it's, it'd be nice for some maybe pulled pork or oh you know, yeah slow a slow and uh -huh. low, low and slow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what I'm this is an, another really another rhythm case, but what I see initially is like a really slow rate again. So at slower rates, I think it's easier just to count the complexes. One, two, three, four, four times uh, what six? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, Twenty-four. Ten seconds trip. <laughs> Six that of those is, in one minute. <laughs> that's really slow. 24. Okay, so slow rate. Now the rhythm. Let's check out the P waves, which I do see. I see them best in lead two on the rhythm strip on the bottom. And again, just a reminder, leads V1 and 2. Those are your, your money leads for P waves. So I'm going to start right here. I see a P wave kind of coming out of that T wave at the very end. I'm going to start there, and I'm going I'm to try and march these out. So P wave, yeah, the P waves march out really nicely. And actually what I see is that 
the QRS complexes march out very nicely too. They're both regular, but I see that there is one QRS complex for every three P waves. So this is a three to one block, which is a high grade AV block. And uh, presumably this would be a Mobitz two block, a second degree Mobitz two. I say that because the PR interval is consistent across all the complexes. So this looks like a, a second degree Mobitz two rhythm to me, three to one block. The axis is, it's up in one, it's up in ABS, so there's a normal axis. The intervals, the QRS complex may just be, nah, actually it looks narrow to me. I'm gonna say the QRS complex is narrow, the PR interval is uh, normal. The QT is long, which is really kind of expected at slower rates. Let's see if we can find a good one to measure it here. So start here, 200, 400, 600 and chain, you know, 640 or so. So yeah, pretty long. And then signs of ischemia, well, you can see these massive T wave inversions. They're not subtle. So I would say that for signs of ischemia. So Mobitz two blocks are infranodal blocks. They're not blocks in the AV node itself, which is what first degree and Mobitz one blocks most often are. So this is, Mobitz 2 is more likely to go into complete heart block. And in fact, that's exactly what we see on the next ECG. This was a subsequent ECG during the same encounter, and the patient has now gone into complete heart block. And there's a ventricular escape rhythm, except for this last one is narrow, so uh, maybe a little junctional rhythm kind of got through there, but the rest of them are wide. Uh, this is a ventricular escape rhythm and, and super slow. So what are the critical actions in this patient? So similar to the last patient that we spoke about, we're going to get our IV O2 monitor prepared for this patient, get some pacer pads on. Um, and then really my next question is, what are we going to do for this patient? Are we going to attempt some medications like atropine to potentially help? Yeah, it's not uncommon that these patients come in having already gotten atropine by pre-hospital. They see slow rate and, you know, sense, seems reasonable. Just give atropine and see if it works. This is not going to work in someone with an infranodal block. In fact, it may just worsen it. So I would advise you to just avoid atropine. And anyone with an infranodal block, avoid atropine. The only time I would consider atropine in the setting of complete heart block is if I knew that that block was in the AV node, would the QRS complex be wide or narrow in that scenario? It should be narrow. Yeah, so if, if you have a narrow complex in the setting of complete heart block, that's the only situation where you really can be sure that the block is in the AV node. And I'm gonna demonstrate that on the next slide. So this is a reminder from the ECG Stampede curriculum. And this is a slide that we took from there, but these are the steps to go through to figure out where exactly the block is. So step one, if the QRS is wide, you'll proceed to step two. If it's normal, meaning narrow, then the block is in the AV node. That's really the only time that you can be absolutely sure that it's in the AV node. Uh, if you have a Mobitz 1, so the PR interval is progressively lengthening from one beat to the next, and then it ends up dropping, then you know the block is in the AV node too. So uh, Mobitz 1 likely to be in the AV node, and if it's narrow, it's in the AV node. Those might be patients that it's worth trying atropine in. Yeah, sounds good. And just a reminder, this diagram comes from Unit 8, so if you have any questions, you can go back and watch the videos from Unit 8 within the curriculum. Nice. It's always good to support our own propaganda. Yeah. Ready for case three? Let's do it. Ready or not, here we come. 63-year-old male that presented with lower back pain. That's what LBPS, lower back pain. Hmm. Sounds like a great reason to get an ECG. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, kind of a scary looking ECG though. Wide complex tachycardia. Why don't you walk us through this one? Yeah, so wide complex tachycardia, the first thing that everyone always thinks of and gets really scared about is VT, or ventricular tachycardia. But let's actually break this down and, and look at it a little bit more closely. Uh, so when we look at the rate, rate is probably about 300, 150, somewhere between 100 and 150. 120 or so. Yeah, the, uh, the rhythm, a little bit difficult to discern. I don't see P waves very clearly. And again, our P wave leads are V1, 
and lead two. Those are the, the best leads for looking to see P waves. I'm not convinced that I clearly see any P waves yeah, here. Yeah, me either. Yeah. Uh, the axis is up in one, down in AVF, so there's a leftward axis. Um, our intervals, uh, again, I don't see a P wave. Our QRS complex is wide, um, and our QT segment looks normal. Uh, and for signs of ischemia, I don't see any clear ST elevations, ST depressions, or anything else I want to call just at this point. Um, but again, I'd be confused as to why we got this ECG and trying to think about the clinical context of this patient when determining what this rhythm actually is. What do you think? Well, let, let's go through the differential. What is on your differential for a wide, complex tachycardia? Let's write them down. Sure. So first, uh, probably most dangerous, ventricular tachycardia. Sure. And if you just assume that they're all ventricular tachycardia, most likely people are not going to fault you. But I think we can do better. I think so, too. Um, now, this case is, or this rhythm looks regular to me. Um, so with a regular rhythm and a wide complex tachycardia, other things I think about is just sinus tach, perhaps, with oh, okay. an aberrancy, some sort of, you know, bundle branch block pattern. Okay. So sinus tach, got it. How about, how about SBT with aberrancy? Yeah, I like that. I don't know how to spell aberrancy, so I'm just going to leave it like that. Yeah. Is so there two B's, one B, two R's? Two R's. I, don't, I don't remember. An E in there? I don't know. I'm not even sure I'm saying it right. Was there a niner in there? <laughs> what else do you have on the list? Well, how about an antidromic pre-excitation syndrome? Antidromic Wolf Parkinson White, AVRT. Oh. Oh. How about that? Sure. That Atrial sounds good. ventricular reentrant tachycardia. That sounds fancy. It is fancy. What else? What about a sodium channel blockade? Oh, gosh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's your favorite. Is that your it, favorite? It is my favorite. I do enjoy that. Had one about a week or two ago. Did you? What, what was it? An amitriptyline overdose. Really? Yeah. You, like, yeah. never see TCAs yeah. anymore. Yeah. That's awesome. Gave some bicarb. Narrowed that QRS complex. Why didn't you submit that ECG? I forgot. <laughs> you bastard. I'll pull it up. I, I still have it. <laughs> we'll do that one. It's coming up. Another conference. That's a pretty good list. What about one more? You always got to throw a hyper hyper, in there, yeah, right? Hyper you always have on to. All of them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So yeah, that's pretty good differential, I think. How do we go about determining which one of these it is? Well, I think maybe Certainly. the first thing we can do is look at an old ECG. I think How that's that? usually a safe start. And here is said old ECG. And if I'm looking at this old one, it's not tachycardic here. And what I'm seeing is a wide complex. I'm seeing an extreme left axis deviation. So in the setting of a wide complex, which looks like a right bundle branch block, there's an RSR prime and V1, just a reminder about a right bundle branch. So RSR prime and V1, a, a wide S in the lateral leads, V5, V6, uh, you see it in one. You actually don't see it in AVL here, but uh, it, it's a wide S in those lateral leads. So that is a right bundle. And then also you notice that it's up going in one and down going in AVF. So there's a left axis deviation and it's an extreme left axis deviation. So that's a left anterior fascicular block. So this is a bifascicular block. And if we look at P waves, which you can really only make out, I think, in V1 up here. Unfortunately, I don't have the rhythm strip for that, but I see a P wave here and a P wave here and a really long PR. And so this is a tri-fascicular block. That means that the likely scenario here is while there could be some disease in the AV node, which is slowing conduction, causing a first degree block, it's likely actually a diseased third remaining fascicle. The only one that's conducting is that left posterior uh, fascicle, and it's probably got some disease and it's conducting really slowly. This is someone that could progress to complete heart block. Yeah, absolutely. And so for me, after seeing the old ECG here with the very, very similar morphologies of the QRS complex, I would be less concerned about ventricular tachycardia in our patient that we're seeing today uh, just because of these similarities. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so let's go back to the original ECG here. And this is the one that's tachycardic to about 120. The first thing I'll say about the rate is 
while you can have ventricular tachycardia at this rate, it's a little bit slower than I would usually expect VTAC to be. So that makes me wonder if something else is going on as opposed to just ventricular tachycardia. Maybe it is one of those other entities like sinus tachycardia or even tox or metabolic problems. Sure. So when we look at this uh, original ECG, uh, we can see that very similar right bundle branch pattern, right? That RSR prime. Yeah, the morphology of the QRS is, is the same. So that, again, coupled with the slower rate, is leading me more to, away from ventricular tachycardia. Okay, yeah. And if I look at that RSR prime, uh, you know, if it were VTAC, often the first bunny ear is taller than the second one in V1 and V2. And if you look at this one... The second one is taller than the first one. That's pretty typical for a normal right bundle branch morphology, not a, uh, a ventricular in origin beat. So that's another thing that speaks against ventricular tachycardia. I see that the axis is the exact same as the original ECG, or I'm, I'm sorry, as the patient's uh, um, prior ECG. So that also points to, uh, against ventricular tachycardia. And then, you know, the, the biggest thing here, I think, John, is just talk to the patient. Yeah. This is a, a guy who had no chest pain, no uh, shortness of breath, so no cardiopulmonary complaints whatsoever. He was just here for some lower back pain. That doesn't sound like VTAC to me. No. So what should we do in this patient? I'd probably try to control his symptoms with some pain medication, maybe. Sure, let him chill out for a second. Maybe yeah. just give them a little, you know, tunnel, something, see, see what sure. happens. And indeed, that's what we did. And the rate slowed. So what's happening here is that that P wave, because the PR interval is so long, it's just getting buried within the prior T wave and you can't see it. So this is just sinus tachycardia masquerading as ventricular tachycardia. Cool case, huh? Yeah, cool case. Yeah. Another cool thing about this is I transferred this dude to you. Yes. From my hospital to your hospital. Yes. Everyone was very excited was about the CCG. I, I appreciated that gift. Uh, our residents learned a lot from these ECGs that it's, day. So it's and very it's exciting. the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. All right. Until next time. Yeah. It was a pleasure, Stan Peters. <laughs>